we are delighted to introduce atmospheric disturbances over the wall. Uh, please welcome Rivka Galichin and William Tukri, uh, introduced by Superior uh, Nair. Hi everybody, thank you for being here. I hope you've had a lovely day at the festival. Um, it, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, what I think will be the last session today at the Darbar Hall. We'll be hearing from two extraordinary novelists about their works. And the way we've decided to play this is that we'll have first one talk about their work and read from it, then the other, and then perhaps sort of lead from there into dialogue and op open the floor up to uh, questions from you. We'll start with William Sutcliffe, to my right, in case we were in any doubt, who is the author of six novels, most recently a novel called The Wall, which was published in April last year. Um, Wall is also the first, I think, of William's novels that could be said to have been written with a young adult audience in mind, um, in that it functions at one level as a story that can be read by a reader who has very little knowledge of the situation it describes and that it operates at a completely different level for people who do realize with dawning horror uh, as they read the novel that it describes quite acutely conditions uh, in the West Bank and it is a novel about about occupation and about uh, settlement and about the military segregations of the population there. Um, I'd like to ask William to talk a little bit about the novel so that he can tell you just as much as he'd like you to know and then perhaps read from it. William? Of course, that's my pleasure. I've, I should just check that I'm all, I've started an event earlier very enthusiastically without realizing I was inaudible. So before I say anything this time, I'll check. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes? Yes, okay, that's good. Um, so uh, every writer is looking for a subject. That's your sort of raw material. And even if you're, you want to write a small book, hopefully what you want is a big subject. And in the course of trying to figure out what to write next, after my last book, I was, well, I've been circling for a long time around the idea that it seems to me that the big subject of our times is the gulf, increasing gulf between the haves and the have-nots. And more importantly, the increasing invisibility of the have-nots in the eyes of the haves. And this is possibly less uh, extreme in India than it is in the West. But in the West, I feel I'm very struck by the fact that we're all the time we're using phones and computers assembled by people earning a dollar a day. We're wearing clothes assembled by people living on the other side of the world in possibly atrocious conditions. And we're in some ways intimately connected with these people, but they're totally invisible to us. And now that's an interesting notion, but it's by no means the starting point for a novel. Uh, so this was swirling around in my head, and it began to connect with another thing that was happening. As, as the wall in the West Bank, the so-called security wall in the West Bank began to be built, it started going up in about 2003. Um, as the, my novelist's eye sort of settled on this wall as something that was interesting. I'm Jewish, from a British Jewish family, not a religious family, and not really a Zionist family either, but I think all Jewish people, you feel you can't just remain ignorant or indifferent to Israel. You feel under some pressure to make your mind up about what you think, which often isn't easy. Um, so I was maybe knew a little bit more about Israeli politics than I might have done otherwise, but when the wall started to be built, I started to think about this um, in more clearly, partly because it seemed on the one hand like a very concrete and specific, literally concrete and metaphorically sort of concrete thing being built in a specific place, but also in some way a metaphor for what is happening everywhere. A barrier going up between the haves and the have-nots, a physical barrier and also a um, psychological barrier, an ability to, n to not think about the other people living much harder 
much more difficult lives upon whom we the privileged depend, but pretend they're not there. And I began to conceive of a novel in a sort of metaphor, a semi-fictionalized version of the West Bank about a kid who's effectively a settler kid living in a little privileged enclave, a settlement behind a wall, and he's been told that the people on the other side are the enemy. They're all bad, they're evil, they want to get us, we need the wall to protect us, and if you set foot on the other side of the wall, they'll get you, because they hate us. Um, and then he stumbles across via a game, he's the 13-year-old kid, because it's a sort of coming-of-age novel. 13 is the age at which, according to Jewish tradition, a child becomes a man. Um, he stumbles across a tunnel, goes to the other side, and what he finds on the other side is very much not what he's expecting. He, doesn't, he finds this sort of good, evil, us, them debate falls apart. Some people come after him, and a girl helps him, and then she in turn gets in trouble, and he realizes he owes her something. So I wrote the first draft of this novel, set in this abstract that play, sort of loosely based on the West Bank, and I was kind of dissatisfied with it. it it was working, but there was something missing, partly because I knew I hadn't made up my mind. Was this the West Bank or was it not the West Bank? I sort of, I needed to decide, but I didn't know how to decide. And then I heard about the Palestine Festival of Literature, which is a literature festival a bit like this one, except with one key difference, which is that because the wall and other restrictions, Palestinians can't travel freely within the West Bank. The wall, most of the wall is within the West Bank stops them traveling within the West Bank. It's not just about stopping Palestinians getting into Israel. So the festival, in order to work, it can't stay in one place and let the audience come to the festival because the audience can't travel very easily. So the, it's like a road show. The festival takes a group of authors, European authors, American authors, Palestinian diaspora authors, and local authors up and down the West Bank to various places, East Jerusalem, Nablus, Jenin, Bethlehem, Hebron, and you do events a bit like this to local audiences. And also in between that, it has a kind of didactic element in that it teaches the um, writers who've gone on there about what's really happening. And you come back, however much, I'd done a fair amount of research into the West Bank before I went, but it was still an absolute shock what I saw, uh, both intellectually and emotionally. It was. It was so much more brutal than I expected it to be. The, the phrase military occupation trips off the tongue very easily, but when you actually see it, when you see what it means to be in a place that's been under occupation by a foreign army for more than 40 years, about 46 years now. So people older than me, I'm 42, people older than me who've never lived any, under any other conditions than foreign occupation. Um, and just see that it's about guns, it's about physical force, that even when, you know, um, you read about what's happening there through the news and you realize that only when a gun is fired, that's news. But an unfired gun is not news. But when you go there, you realize the essence of occupation, the really important things about violence and war is the unfired gun. The fact that if there's some 19-year-old kid with a gun saying, no, you can't go this way, you have to go back, then you have to go back. So you have very young people in this occupying army exercising complete control over the local populace. And endless other details, the, the sort of legal injustices, the, the uh, you know, what I hadn't realized before I went, that the, all the settlers there, wherever they live, are living under, subject to Israeli law, which follows normal human rights, but all the Palestinians, wherever they live, living, are subject to military law, which has a conviction rate above 99%. And these sort of injustices and the brutality of going through the checkpoints, especially seeing going through these checkpoints as a Jew is a very strange experience. You go through with the Palestinians and there are sort of Jewish soldiers up on gantries with weapons sort of pointing down at you and you go through these very tiny cages, a very deliberately humiliating experience. The, the cages have literally been constructed by an American firm that makes uh, cages for cattle. It's, it's very brutal, very humiliating. And as a writer, I came back knowing a lot more about the place, but weirdly knowing a lot less about how to write the book. I was, uh, I was really sort of knocked for six by the experience, quite upset by it, very confused, and I couldn't actually even look at my manuscript for a while, partly because I felt a huge sense of responsibility to the, the people I'd met, the people I'd talked to. I thought, I can't write a bad book or a casual book or a half-hearted book about this. I mean, those things are t terrifying to you as a writer anyway, but I felt it's in a personal responsibility to those people. And I was afraid of going back to it, but eventually I did go back to it, 
and I realized that I had to make it somewhat closer to that place. I had to make it more specific. I didn't need to be 100% specific, but I had to focus in. And I began to realize that the only thing that place connected to in my head with what I knew already is it weird, it felt like a dystopian novel. It felt like it's a real place, but the, the only imagination with these sort of fantasy dystopias you read, and I realized a lot of young adult novels are set in these fantasy dystopias, often in very harsh conditions, very brutal, divided societies. And I realized that my protagonist was 13, and it's a first person novel, so everything has to be not necessarily something a 13 year old could say, but something a 13 year old could think. And I began to realize maybe this is an interesting way into it. So the next thing I did was I, I reread Animal Farm. And I thought that was a, a very interesting example of a novel that is two novels at once. It's very obviously, for adults, it's a novel about Stalin. And for children, it's a novel about, it's a barnyard fable. And it's interesting, I'd done it at school, I reread it as an adult, I realized actually the child's reading of that book is, is by no means dumb. It's, it's a very interesting, powerful, moral fable about politics, even if you don't know who Stalin is. And I thought, okay, this is interesting, a novel that's two things at once. And I thought I could make, if I make the book more detailed, as detailed as I can, and get all the facts absolutely right about the place, to the extent that it's almost reportage, I can at the same time write a book that's sort of at the other end of the spectrum of realism, that it will also feel like a sort of fantasy, dystopia, YA novel for younger readers. And this was sort of this sort of strange target I set myself, trying to write two, two very different things at once within the same text. It's not two different texts, all the same text. And that was the goal, and that began to correlate in my head with another thought I had, which I realized that one of the main tropes of children's fiction is the character from who living their normal mundane everyday life in their normal mundane everyday world who discovers a portal to a fantastic wonderful fantasy land you know Alice in Wonderland Harry Potter Secret Garden the list is endless it's a really common trope in children's fiction and I began to realize that what I was writing about in this story about the child of religious settlers in the West Bank as essentially an atheist myself, I began to think that these settlers, they're actually, what they're doing is they're bringing their children up in a fantasy land. The settlers' view of the world is complete fantasy. So I thought, this is interesting. I can turn that children's fiction trope upside down. And I realized that what this story was, it's about a child brought up in a world of fantasy who discovers a portal to reality. And that was another sort of key thing, a way into the book. I then, I won't go on for much longer, I then had to do another research trip later to visit some settlers because I realized they had to be even-handed. I had a very, very strange research trip where I found someone who took me into the West Bank um, on the Israeli roads, the settler roads, in a different car with a yellow number plate which takes you on a different road system through the same landscape but to the hilltops where the settlers live instead of the valleys underneath where the Palestinians live, where I'd been before. And these two itineraries, they absolutely overlapped, but they never intersected. And on the one itinerary, I came up against the wall again and again and again, eight meters of concrete. And on the Israeli roads, the settler roads, I never came up against the wall. It's hidden away. And where you do come up against it, there are land banks to make the eight meters look like four meters. And it's literally, it's got stone cladding on it, pink, pretty stones to make it look pretty. And one of the settler fam settlers, I said to him, how do you feel about bringing up your children so close to the wall? And he was originally American. And he said, oh, we're from New Jersey. We used to have walls just like that by the freeways in New Jersey, and we called them sound barriers. So he was completely oblivious to the wall, which again struck me as a slight Alice in Wonderland thing. So anyway, now I'm going to make a short reading from the book, um, which is about the boy. He's been over to the other side, and he's got in trouble and he's come back and he's now back home in his town and his stepfather who's called Liev has been told by the mother to punish him. He doesn't tell the parents where he's been, he just told them he got lost in a building site. By the time Liev arrives home, I've washed and changed and I'm curled up on the sofa in a nest of cushions watching a cartoon. It's about a dog who keeps on trying to leave his house and get the bone he's left outside but whenever he does, he's smacked in the face with a plank by another bigger dog who hides in wait for him. The smaller dog never gives up, 
He keeps on looking for new roots to his bone, but every time he gets close, the bigger dog appears with his plank and whacks him over the head. It's quite funny. Liev does what he usually does when he walks in. He goes to the kitchen. Mum is there, cooking, and I can tell by the tense gabble of her voice that she's telling Liev what I've done, or what she thinks I've done, and is asking him to tell me off. From the suck and slap of the fridge door, I can hear that Liev is snacking as she talks. I feel him appear in the doorway, but don't look up. Your mother tells me you did something stupid today, he says. I shrug, contemplating my options. I could ignore him, putting off the conflict, but that would just make him angrier. I could be sarcastic, calling mum your wife to match his your mother, which might be briefly satisfying, but would ultimately make everything worse. It's never worth getting Liev angry. Most conversations I have with him, I'm thinking ahead like a chess player, figuring out my best moves to give away as little ground as possible without pushing him into one of his rages. I glance up and see that although he's facing towards me, his neck is turned and his eyes are on the cartoon. This is a good sign. If he was in the mood for an argument, he'd have switched off the TV before speaking to get my attention. He would have positioned himself in front of me with his hot breath on my face. Having other people's attention is a big thing for Liev. Few things make him crosser than the idea you might not be listening to him. The way he's standing and his weary tone of voice give the impression he's ticking me off only to satisfy my mother. She clearly hasn't succeeded in communicating the level of her panic. Everything looks calm now. No one is missing, no one has been harmed. It seemed as if he's just it seems seems as if he just doesn't believe anything bad really happened. He's going through the disciplinary motions as a domestic chore. I just have to play along. I lost a ball in the building site. I was, it wasn't even me that kicked it, I say. You gave your mother a terrible fright. I know, I said sorry. Well, that's good, he says. But if you ever... His voice tails away, distracted. The small dog is climbing up the chimney, but the big one has seen what he's doing through the window and is hiding behind a chimney pot with his plank. The small dog's head appears. He looks around and smiles, thinking the coast is clear. He jumps out and is all ready to leap down from the roof when the big dog stands up with his plank and swings it like a baseball bat. Whack! With, a, with the sound of a long descending whistle, the small dog flies into the far distance while the bigger dog runs around the four corners of the roof like he scored a home run, acknowledging the cheers of an imaginary crowd. Liev gives a tiny, comma-sized smile and turns back to me. If you ever, you know, lose something in there again, you have to promise me you won't go in. Okay. I say, that seems to be it, easy. If he knew what I'd really done, where I'd been. He's already on his way out when curiosity gets the better of me. Why, I say. He stops and turns, his face now blank and puzzled, as if he's already forgotten what we were talking about. What, he says. What's in there that's so forbidden? Nothing, it's just private property. Whose is it? Well, it's private, but I suppose it belongs to all of us. So it's public. It's disputed. By who? The people who used to live there. Who used to live there? No one. No one? So who's disputing what? You know what I mean, smart guy, he says with a sneer. They abandon their houses, then they act like it's our fault. I saw it. I was in there, I say. I saw the house. He stares at me, not blinking, a cold, level gaze. Have you seen it too, I ask. He shrugs. They're bad people. They build without permits. They don't listen to the government. They don't listen to the army. They only understand violence. What happened to the people who lived there? Where are they now? I should explain he's found a demolished house in this building site. They're gone. Gone where? Somewhere they belong. Why are you asking all these stupid questions? I just, it was weird. The house, it's all smashed up, but everything is still there as if they didn't even pack. As if something just fell out of the sky in the middle of an ordinary day and crushed the place. It felt spooky. <sighs> you don't have to worry. Nothing fell out of the sky. It can't happen to us. That's not what I mean. I felt something bad. You felt something. Did anyone die? I sense him begin to lose his patience. 
When these things happen, every care is taken to save lives, but some people don't want to be saved. And people die everywhere all the time. It's normal. What's crazy is that we have to fight so hard for every square inch of land we want to live on. What's crazy is that there are traitors who help those people fight for land that ought to be ours. What's crazy is that some people won't stay where they're put and just go on and on and on trying to stop us living normal, peaceful lives. And if you're having feelings and worrying about things that don't concern you, then I suggest you concentrate a bit harder on your studies and spend less time speculating about things you can't possibly understand. Do you hear me? He's now looming over me. And above his beard, I can see his face is flushed with tiny deltas of purple veins lit up around the rims of his nostrils. I shrug and turn back to the TV. The big dog is now hammering the smaller dog into the ground like a fence post. Liev stands over me a short while longer, slightly out of breath from his rant, then slips away back to the kitchen. Thank you. Hello. William, I think one of the most difficult tasks in fiction must be to develop the voice of a child narrator, and yet that's something that you did. Um, and that's something that I get the feeling that you feel had to be done in the writing of this book. Would you like to talk kind of briefly about that? About well, I think it's, a, it's very important as a way in. I mean, I think writing a political novel, and this novel does have a political agenda, is very difficult because you don't want to explain too much, you don't want to hammer away at things too much. And um, a child's voice is an interesting way into it because obviously children, especially when you have a first-person child narrator, yeah. the, child, your, the job of your narrator is only to describe what they notice. So his everyday environment is sort of invisible to him. Yeah. So that sort of gets you off the hook. Um, and because he's in a very, he doesn't really understand what's around him very much, mm -hmm. it gives you a novelistic reason to explain because he doesn't understand and in the course of a novel he comes to understand what he didn't understand before, yes. which is that his people are, he thought they were the victims and he discovers that his people are sort of the oppressors in this place. Yes. Um, and so because he learns that, we as readers can learn that from him. Whereas if you're writing an adult novel, you'd be thinking, why, why does, why doesn't this guy know this any? Yeah. Why doesn't this? If the, if the characters know yeah, it already, it'd feel no like kind of for the novelist to describe it. Yeah, the exposition would feel kind of forced, I suppose. And one of the things, as we were talking earlier, one of the things that I find most striking about the wall um, is its sort of really sharp, you know, description. Uh, it's it's really sharp look at what learning a truth, learning the truth about the wall in this case, can do to alter your perception of reality. Um, uh, and seeing that through the eyes of Joshua kind of helps us feel the weight of that truth uh, much more dramatically and much more deeply as well. Um, I'm going to take the thought of altered perceptions of reality very smoothly and a little disingenuously and move to what is a very, very different novel, uh, Atmospheric Disturbances, which Rivka Kalshan published in 2008. Rivka's also been a journalist. Her works appeared in Harper's Magazine and New Yorker, The New Yorker and The New York Times Magazine, among, <clears throat> among other publications. Um, I wonder, uh, maybe I should say this as a question, but I'm going to say it. Um, perhaps the kind of, you know, the, the, the demands of nonfiction, you know, a certain kind of linearity, uh, a certain kind of fidelity to a certain kind of fact, uh, might, have, might, might say something about the fact that Rivka's only novel to date, Atmospheric Disturbances, uh, happens to be a work of marvelous experimentation. We start out with our protagonist, a psychiatrist, uh, discovering that his beautiful Argentinian wife um, is, has been replaced by a simulacrum who, um, who's, who talks and behaves exactly like, you know, like his wife. Um, and the book is, among other things, about his quest to discover his, his missing real wife, uh, a quest that takes him through New York, through Argentina, um, and through some, through some of the most bizarre, beautiful, kind of mind-altering um, landscapes, scapes, uh, scapes off his mind. I'm going to stop talking, Rivka, because I'd like you to, to talk about the novel. Uh, could you introduce it to us and then perhaps read from it. Yeah. 
I think, I think oh, this right. might work. Yes. Um, so uh, I really loved the image that William brought up about the portal that normally sort of in children's literature, the portal is from sort of the ordinary world of the child into some sort of extraordinary world or sort of world that operates by a different set of rules. And I, and I think, and I like the idea of inverting that um, because both I feel like a novel itself ends up having this sort of space where you can see something like over the child's head or over the narrator's head but also they end up showing something to you that's become a little bit dead to you when you sort of go in between the two worlds. So this novel, um, I originally trained as a physician and uh, I was most interested usually in the psychiatry. And you'll, you would often come across a lot of interesting stories where people were, you know, living in a, in a world that we wouldn't quite like agree on the details of it, but they would often have an emotional truth. And one of the cases that came through the psychiatric ER at one point was a woman who was you know, convinced that the government was following her and had done all these terrible things to her. And that part you know, probably wasn't true, but she was convinced that among the things they had done was that they had stolen her child. Um, so she was sort of in intense emotional distress and had replaced her child with an identical child. And she said, the problem is I'm not willing to trade in the new child because I've fallen in love with the new child as well. So I want my child back, but I want to keep the one I have. And, and there was something kind of emotionally accurate about that, I imagine, for all parents just when they watch their kids grow up. They think, I don't want the sort of new older child, but I'm also not willing to give up the one I have. So that was kind of emotionally of interest to me in this novel where this man is you know very in love with the woman he fell in love with and when she sort of becomes another person as we all do he's sort of confounded by this so i'm just going to read a passage from it um can you all hear rivka yeah. okay right. thank you um so this is a, this is pretty close to the beginning of the book but um little fee feedback all right. Yeah, and just um, so he's sort of been, con he's, he's seen his wife and he, he feels like, oh, it looks like her, it sounds like her, but it's not her, although she doesn't seem to be acknowledging it. So he sort of stepped out and here he is, he's come back um, to this woman and he's still trying to figure out what's going on. So he says, I put my key to the lock, I heard scratching at the door. I opened the door and I found myself being lavished with affection, affection from the russet dog. So that's the one thing she's done that's his clue, is that she's come home with a dog and she's not really a dog person. Then the dog undid my left shoelace. I heard a voice coming from the bedroom and I heard a hanging up of a telephone. Meanwhile, this dog still had my shoelace between its teeth and was shaking its head back and forth behavior that may appear playful, but that is quite clearly a manifestation of the instinct to break the neck of caught prey, a manifestation that we refer to as cute. It's just, how, it's just like how we have so successfully forgotten as a species that a smile was born as a masking afterthought to the sudden baring of teeth. At least, that's the most convincing smile theory I've heard. Then the woman emerged from the bedroom. I smiled. She was the same, the same false vision of Rima from before. The dog makes you happy, substitute Rima asked, and what could I answer except no. The dog then left me, left my shoelace for her. She picked that dog up in her arms, snuggled the dog with oversized gestures as if performing on stage. She told me she didn't care what I thought about what to name the dog, that she was going to name her without me. I said I didn't care what she named the dog, the dog that was licking her face with dedication. But I got this dog, she said to me, for you. The dog had dark, wet eyes. The woman's eyes were similar. Then I noticed that she, the simulacrum, had fine lines of age on her face. Tiny crow's feet, and not just when she smiled, since I could see them, and she was not smiling. This look-alike Rima, I began to realize, was not such a perfect look-alike. It would seem Rima was being played by someone older, 
or who at least looked older. Someone pretty, but not as pretty. Not that there's anything wrong with an older woman. There's nothing wrong with a woman my age, for example. I just don't happen to be married to one. You said dogs are brilliant, she said, her voice super saturated with emotion. You said Freud's dogs could diagnose the patients. But Rima knew Freud was essentially demoted, in a few specific passages promoted, out of my notion of an ideal psychiatry. As the impostors talked on, I wondered, was Rima kidnapped or did she willingly leave? Which would be worse? Determined not to let emotion crack my voice, I tried to avoid speaking altogether. The simulacrum, fortunately, seemed to have the same talent as Rima for filling up silent spaces, and she went on. You said Freud's dogs knew when therapy was over and knew who was psychotic and who was neurotic and that when memories were recovered, the dog would wag its tail. You said you would have liked to have such insight, such dog insight, that it would be better than your own. And so there I was at the hospital and this poor dog was left orphan and it seemed like a sign, like not just random, like this dog was sent to us, for us to save her and for her to save us. Silly, I know. But no, you just look at me strange. The russet puppy, I mean dog, was licking tears from the doppelganger's face. But Freud's dogs, I said, they were chow dogs. It was all I could think of to say. I turned away from this woman and went to the bathroom where I ran hot water over my hands, which is something I like to do in the colder months. It just makes me feel a little bit better. Then I touched my face with my warmed hands. It calms me down. It's just this very normal thing that I do. Over the sound of the running water, I could hear that Rima-like voice calling through the door. She didn't sound pleased. I was thinking, does Rima know this twin of hers? Did Rima complain about me to her? There were difficult aspects of Rima. I can't deny that. A lot of this arguing through a bathroom door had been going on of late. The Rima-ish voice came through the door with something about being tired of it always being her getting stuck with the label of unreasonable, irrational, crazy. I thought to shout back that of course it was her getting stuck with that label, and that furthermore I'd only ever said irrational and unreasonable, never crazy, and that it was she alone who was assigning normative value to those labels, and listen, she couldn't even let a man just wash his hands in peace. But I stopped myself, instead said nothing, thinking to myself, this fight is stupid, this fight is ridiculous, and to have it with a woman I don't even know, that's even more ridiculous. Older, wrong, and no more manageable, this replacement wife. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, two of the, yours is a book that has sort of these strange, complex, interesting narrative relationships with science. Um, most directly, uh, two of the sciences they're concerned with are psychiatry, which your protagonist practices, and meteorology, as, uh, as the title suggests. And I, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, you know, sort of what connection... Uh, uh, it strikes me that both of these are sciences with a high margin of error and with sort of... with great applicability in daily life. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about kind of, you know, the relationship between perhaps these particular sciences and writing and how that works uh, in atmospheric disturbances. What, what I was interested about scientific language for, for, what I was interested about scientific language for this particular narrator is that it's a kind of language we think of as very factual, sort of inarguable, when in fact it's, it's, uh, it's not, it ex it's sort of has all this authority, um, but it's really easy to misuse and really easy to misinterpret and often can be sort of obscuring rather than illuminating. And I thought, well, it's, it's, it's like a handy thing to have a narrator who's trying to sort of hook on to this language that's convincing in order to convince himself of something that has like the, the appeal of seeming to explain things when really like what's, what's useful about it to him is that it's a way for him to hide information from himself. Can I come back to the thing that I said I was going to ask you as a question first and then didn't? Um, which was about, you, you know, a lot of, uh, some of your nonfiction itself has also been concerned with science. 
And um, I wondered about your, the tradition you've drawn, of course, in fiction is kind of very different. It's a sort of high modernist, uh, you know, Borgesian um, way of interrogating reality. Um, can you draw any lines at all between the kind of nonfiction you've had to write and written in the past and, you know, this, com this completely different model of fiction that you've followed? Um, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I find it very enjoyable to, to do um, journalism and nonfiction about science in part because it, it seems like this, it's this other world that most people are intimidated by. I mean, I'm intimidated by it as well. And therefore, I think that uh, it's, it's often an illusion. It's a place where like a lot of emotion goes with the sort of fantasy idea of what the science might be saying. Yes. And, um, and, I, and in my fiction also, I'm often sort of interested in, in kind of the, the sort of walls of reality that you run into when you actually go and gather information about something, whether, right. whatever it might be. Right, so a literary, so in fact, the, the literary ambiguity that we see in like kind of more uh, traditionally realist novels kind of marries itself for you with with you know the real ambiguities of, of, of science and writing and thinking about science as well and perhaps in the method itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I was sort of thinking about it when William was talking about this idea of this kid going out and finding out that he grew up in a fantasy world. Yes. Um, and that it's, a, it's that same sort of gap and there's a sort of excitement when you get the two perspectives next to one another and they both destabilize each other. Yeah. I think... Can I ask you about that? Yeah. I'm interested that you're a psychiatrist. I mean, I don't know if you... Um, is the microphone still working? Yeah. If you have any idea, what do you think of the idea of this wall in the West Bank being a physical wall and a psychological wall? Do you think, wonder what you think about the idea of physical, real walls as sort of mental walls and how with sort of psychiatric training you, you interpret the things that people know but can't let themselves think about? Yeah, well, I always think it's interesting sometimes when it's extremely literal, like someone will have a stroke and then they literally, you'll say to them, um, can you pick up this water bottle? And they'll pick it up with their hand because one part of their body knows that it's there and the other part will say, well, I don't see anything because they, they think that they can't see it. And so sometimes you'll have like a very literal manifestation like that, which is interesting because I think we're all familiar with the more emotional ones. Um, that we don't believe in, even though we're more familiar with them, where we'll sort of see like, oh, someone's sort of actions suggest they believe one thing, but they sort of speak another, another truth. Like in the passage that William was reading, like the father was almost sort of aware of what the son was thinking without admitting that that was a legitimate thing someone might be thinking. Mm -hmm. I thought that was, a, you know, an interesting drama. But do you think that can apply to a whole community as well as an individual? I mean, whether it's Israel or America or, India, you can have a whole nation state that has and areas they can't let themselves think about. And it so often manifests itself in language, which is like where you build the wall that makes it easier to keep not knowing something. Like, I, I don't know if that was what was going on with the guy saying, oh, this is just like in New Jersey. But on some level, he must know, no, it's not just like New Jersey. Like, on the one hand, he, he must both know and not know. That's like a comforting similarity. Right. Yes. Um, and I'm sorry, I've lost the train of my thought. Well, I, can I pick up yeah. on something you said? That I think that's interesting. We, I mean, I hadn't thought of it in those terms. If you're talking about people who are actually mentally ill, I mean, when you meet people, the settlers, it's interesting. They're not mentally ill. They're not crazy, as in medically crazy. But when you actually talk to them about the world around them, they're what they let themselves, so they're totally delusional. And it's very. So it was a state of mind that, as a, without any medical training, it's very hard to understand. And when you're sitting around a table having a meal with them, they're nice people, and they're nice to their children, and they're very hospitable and welcoming. Well, what I, do you do? I think it's very interesting. I have a friend who says, um, every, we all suffer from a mental illness, a very rare mental illness, of which we're the only victim. And so I, I, I do think there's something very true about that, that no matter no matter who you are, there are certain things that are unacceptable to you. And maybe for people in a situation like that, what would be unacceptable is that the way they're living or the place that they're living is causing, is problematic in one way or another. And I think like there's not a person in the world who doesn't have something like that. And then when you, but, but what seems remarkable is a sort of whole community kind of collectively telling a story. 
and in fact what i think uh, is interesting is the commonality of the delusions that we can hold uh, as collectives you know all of us who have sort of histories of occupation um, and in, in fact the three countries that you named all do uh, the US and India and Israel um, you know I think perhaps it were the novel a little bit more allegorical um, I'm, uh, you know might, might in fact apply sort of very disquietingly to uh, situations in a, in a lot of places around the world um, having said allegory brings me back to what I wanted to ask you before I completely blipped out sorry about that which is that you chose to write a very directly political novel about what might be, you know, one of the two or three most sensitive issues in the world, uh, which I think was... Um, I, I don't want to sound like kind of needlessly aggrandizing, but I think that was a really bold choice. And, you know, you chose not to sort of take the... We mentioned Orwell and Animal Farm, but Animal Farm was also kind of, a, you know, an allegory, which as a children's tale did in fact function on the level of farmyard animals. Uh, which you've chosen not to do. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it was, well, there was a, in some ways it was a scary thing to take on, but um, I felt driven to it actually partly because uh, there was a controversy in England over a play, Carl Churchill, a very eminent playwright, a British Gentile, wrote this play, Seven Jewish Children, about the uh, Operation Cast led the attack on Gaza in which a lot of children were killed. Um, and she was viciously attacked by a lot of, not a lot of, but a couple of very prominent British Jews attacked her as an anti Semite. Completely wrongly, in my opinion, as you've seen the play. And I began to see this before that critics of Israel were being falsely accused of anti Semitism in order to shut them up, I thought. And I just thought. When that is happening, that's the point at which some Jews need to stand up. And I'm not the first, I'm not the only one, but the voices in the UK, and these voices are very quiet, and the voices in Israel are very loud. There is a left wing that's kind of shrinking, but they're there, there are lots of very articulate, brave people standing up against the government and doing physically, not just writing, but doing very brave things. Going to prison for refusing to serve in the army and a lot more. But still in the UK, I think that the, um, Partly because of the way the media works, they work in a very oppositional way. So if they have a debate about Israel-Palestine, they'll get an Arab to say one thing and then a Jew to say another thing, which gives the impression that all Jews support everything Israel does, which they don't, by any means. I've never met a Jew in London who'd li who likes Netanyahu. Yeah, as, as um, always so with like kind of these really emotive issues, kind of the fringes get the loudest. Um, I just thought it was yeah. time to stand up, and I knew that I'd get a certain amount of flack for that, but I think that's okay as a, as a writer, and I was... And it's funny, after one of the weirdest things I've had to do as a writer is I finished this book, I did a lot of research for the book, and I finished the book, and there's about a year between you finishing a book and a book coming out. And after I'd finished writing the book, I carried on researching in a weird way because I thought, I'm going to get attacked for this book. And I'd learned what I needed to know the right, to write the book. But if you write about Israel, you're going to get attacked every angle, and you need to know everything if you don't know every what happened in 48 and 67 and 73 you can and you're on a platform you can look like an idiot so i sort of did after finishing the novel i did another year's worth of research trying to learn do a little mini ma on the history of israel palestine and, and did the attacks never really came i'm yeah. slightly disappointed <laughs> <laughs> i was all ready to be attacked well I, I i imagine there's still time your book came out last year and you know there, there are whole generations of loons waiting to discover it. it I don't want to wish ill on myself, but yeah, I'll we'll see what happens. Right. Um, speaking of geographies, uh, Rivka, can I ask you perhaps one extremely literal question uh, before we throw it open to the audience? What, what's the Argentina connection over here? Um, um, yeah, so I had, the, I had the, the marriage that's at the center of my book that is, he's, he's an American and he's married to a woman who's Argentine, whose English is pretty good, but not amazing. And one of the reasons I chose that was because I thought, well, every marriage, the other person is a bit of a mystery, but here's a situation where the person's even a little bit more of a mystery, um, just because of a language barrier and an age distance. And that was the kind of relationship both of them were going to choose, where you don't know something. But Argentina, um, I chose... I mean, in part because maybe like I kept reading the newspaper and it was in the news all the time, but um, that's sort of the center of psychoanalytic thought. Like Argentina is the kind of place where if, if you're sort of in a car and someone cuts you off in traffic, the person yells out the window at you like you have no insight, you haven't been analyzed. Like they're very obsessed with 
psychoanalysis and my narrator is very hostile to all the sort of ideas of psychoanalysis. So I, it was just a, a play, a way to play with sort of going south and going to, and you know, it just worked on a lot of sort of playful levels. Yeah. Um, we're, we will take audience questions if you have any. So raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Hi, um, this question. Hello? Yeah, this question is to both of you. Um, I don't. I was wondering if it was coincidental that both of you mentioned dogs in the excerpts that you read, and maybe what significance that has. Like, I, I, I feel like I very much saw the metaphor in, in William's novel, but um, was that just coincidence, or how does that work? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I think Rivka, you should go first. It was a coincidence. Maybe it's meaningful. <laughs> Would you like to talk about the role of dogs in atmospheric disturbances? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm always a little without bit giving of, away too much of I'm the. I'm a little bit of a broken record, but but one thing I sort of think is a, is wonderful about animals is that they never say anything back to you, so you can sort of supply what they might say. There's something just very express. I feel like it's both a more accurate kind of um, relationship where you read, you don't misread the person because you don't say anything, or the dog, you don't misread the dog because you don't say anything to them and they, don't, they can't really say anything to you, and, and you do. Like, I like that, the sort of non-languageness of dogs. I think the dog in my piece is, it's, um, I know my first few novels were sort of more humorous, and then when I started writing this book, I realized there's not really not much scope for humor in this topic. Um, so it's the only novel I've written that's got pretty much no humor in it. Um, and I didn't want to write a satire about it because it's not appropriate, it's not right. Although, but that w one little moment is probably the only little moment of satire in there. But I'm not sure how obvious it is out of context, but it's very, very obvious in the context of the book that that silly little cartoon they're watching is a little metaphor. M metaphor? What's that? A metaphor of uh, Arab-Israeli relations I think that that's pretty clear um, but again you can sort of play out maybe it's a similar thing that you can project project thing project your own ideas and thoughts onto onto a dog and they won't see anything back it's funny one of the most famous uh, Indian stories well Indo-Pakistani stories we have about uh, partition does in fact involve a dog it was written by Manto and it's called the dog of Titval which I think some of our audience might be familiar with you know it's about a dog that's kind of crossing the borders where humans can't and then you know kind of getting caught between these two armies which want to kind of make it their pet and give it sort of different identities and um, well things things don't end well but, um, but I suppose it says something about the fact that you know even animals um, cannot escape unhurt uh, in, in you know in no man's land do we have other questions yes there's a lady in the first row Uh, uh, you may, uh, Supriya mentioned that the book works as a children's book as well as an adult, uh, very serious, on, almost grim adult book. Did you intend it at all for children or it is, uh, it's just a form that you have used? Well, not so much for children but for teenagers, yes. The protagonist is 13 and I think there's a big readership for those books. And I, I just, it just um, seemed to me that if you're writing a book where the character is 13, and it's a first-person uh, narration. You obviously have to keep your language reasonably simple, um, and therefore it will be understandable to a to a younger reader, and they won't get all of it. Um, and also, again, the young adult thing. So there again. So it's published in two editions. In fact, the edition they have on sale in the bookshop here is the young adult edition, uh, which is exactly the same book, but it just has a different cover that makes the look, book look a bit more exciting, and a blurb. On the adult edition says this is a very important and serious book, and the blurb on the young adult book says this is exciting. It's got soldiers in it. Buy it. <laughs> um, so it's just a different approach to sort of selling the book. But I think um, teenagers. I mean, they're perceived as a different market in book selling. But um, and I hadn't read much young adult fiction before I wrote this, and then when I began to realise it was becoming part in part one of those books, I started to read it. And I began to realize it's, it's a different sort of marketing bracket, but there isn't really any gap in terms of what authors are doing. If um, Catcher in the Rye was published today, it would be published as a young adult book, just because it's got a teenage protagonist. But I don't think anyone would say that's not literature. Mm. 
or that it's something that adults shouldn't read or should be embarrassed to be seen reading. And equally, like adult books, when you read young adult fiction, some of it is rubbish and some of it is great writing. Fascinating. I mean, hung, to my surprise, I don't normally like best-selling books, but The Hunger Games, I think, is an excellent book. And lots of adult novelists have tried to skewer sort of reality TV and various other things and she skewers a lot of things very intelligently and very seriously. I think she's a seriously good writer and that's a very interesting book that anyone should read and it's just a kind of question of marketing that happens to have been sold as a, as a YA book. You know, William, sorry to cut into sort of audience time, uh, but I have to ask, we, uh, we had a session on Sri Lankan writing um, on Friday where someone in the audience who is uh, sort of Sri Lankan, uh, a Sri Lankan expatriate, asked the authors, how do I explain to my six-year-old who loves Sri Lanka what civil war is? Mm. And I wonder if you've thought about the uses of the wall or, you know, your writing as a way for young adults to understand what conflict is about. Well, no, definitely. I definitely had another little sort of agenda in this book in terms of how far you could push the... Because I came back feeling very angry. Um, and I knew I had to not write any more of the book while I was still feeling angry, um, which sort of took a while. But I knew I had to... I really, it was really important for me to take the Jewish audience with me for this, for this book. Because what I really want is people like... My eldest child is 10, so he's not really ready for it. But I think, um, I think, you know, especially in America, actually, I think Israel survives on the support of America. And the support comes from America's, Americans who don't really understand what's going there, who have a sort of blind loyalty. And I think Jews who know the history of the Jews um, should know better than to show blind loyalty to any nation state, because every Jew knows what nation states can do when they go bad. Um, and so I think Jews should know what's happening, and young Jews in particular should know. So I'm hoping this is a con contribution to that. I hope that if the novel gets better known, that at least liberal Americans will give it to their teenage kids and they'll understand that the, the propaganda that's thrown at them about Israel always being the victim is, is a, isn't accurate. So again, I don't usually like didactic books. I've tried not to be overtly didactic, mm. but just by shining a light into a place that people don't want to look at and that a lot of Jews in particular don't want to think about, right. that in itself is a, is a didactic act without being sort of overtly didactic in the text, I hope. Mm. More questions? Uh, yes. I have one question uh, for Revka, Revka Galchen. Uh, so definitely... Uh, Okay, uh, Revka, I have one question. Uh, I, I have written so many articles uh, in, uh, in Lokmai Times, uh, which is the uh, prestigious newspaper of India. So I had also tried for New York Times uh, in America, but uh, I had not got uh, the proper window for it to, to write uh, freelancing uh, for the uh, New York Times. So could you help me to get window for it? Um, sorry, we can't admit that question. Okay. Uh, w w questions about the work only, please. Oh, yeah. perhaps, perhaps if you catch Rivka later, you guys can have a chat about the New York Times' sort of freelance hiring practices. Yeah. Uh, yes? Uh, another one for Rivka. Uh, Not about the New York Times, please. No. <laughs> uh, two questions, actually. One, uh, uh, is there really a greater appreciation of the sciences in American writing? Uh, especially, you know, post-modernism, uh, Thomas Pynchon and onwards, right? Uh, I don't see there, that happening enough in the literatures of uh, uh, the other parts of the world. Uh, and second question is, what do you feel about uh, writers, fiction writers uh, mainly, taking uh, liberties with science? I couldn't hear the first part so well because it's a bit echoey. It was about uh, post if I If I have it right, it was about uh, Sciences and writing be being sort of a particularly postmodernist um, thing after Pintron, right? And if you could if you could talk about that a little bit. Sorry, I couldn't hear very well either. So there's a greater acknowledgement of sciences uh, in American writing. So why is that so? It's, greater, you know, it runs from the you know, in, the, in the whole gamut of American literature. It isn't so uh, in other literatures. Why is that so? You know, that's interesting. I've never thought about that. I really don't know. I wonder if you sort of already 
partially answered the question in the sense that I think Pynchon was sort of the, the first who sort of played with that language a lot and sort of thought, well, you know, I'm not just going to play with uh, Greek gods or, you know, sort of references to Shakespeare. I'm also going to play with references to entropy. And so once he sort of did it, it was just sort of out there as like something to do. But I've never, yeah. I've never really thought about that. It occurs to me that, be one person. yeah, it occurs to yeah. me that there's probably a strain in sort of postmodern American writing that does speak to the sciences. But I mean, we also have to keep in mind that, um, you know, li literature and the novel borrows a lot from scientific language and particularly from sort of um, the language of psychology and psychoanalysis uh, in the European tradition, particularly I think in kind of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so perhaps there are cycles and maybe, you know, different cultures kind of respond to these things at different times. But it's a really interesting question. You also had a question which I think was interesting, so I'm going to allow it in spite of the fact cheated. Um, and you asked about sort of how Rivka feels about writers who take liberties with writing about the sciences in literature. Does it make you mad? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I, I have no moral stance on anything. Um, but uh, but uh, I, I do think, in a sense, one should always feel free to take liberties in the sense that I think sort of play is sort of the most interesting way to sort of engage with something because that, the idea with play is that you sort of don't know the answer and you don't know where you're going and you're literally sort of playing and trying it out. But of course, I do think people should be responsible in the sense that there is something, there is something kind of like, it's like scientific language and science is always wearing kind of big shoes and wearing brass knuckles. And I just think you have to be more careful with something that has this kind of power in a sense. And, and therefore, like, it, it, I do think it's like more, it's more power and there's more responsibility because right. of that. It's amazing to me that none of us over here, neither the questioner nor any of us, actually thought about science fiction as a place where, uh, you know, in this discussion, as a place where sciences and That's literature meet. Uh, yeah, um, perhaps, perhaps the question of moral stands about, you know, how science is used or misused might apply there better, but maybe that's a different discussion. Um, other questions? We'll, we have time for one last question, and yes, the most enthusiastic waiver. Okay, um, so. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, currently I'm reading Steinbeck, and so there are these classical literature uh, writers who say that the job of, or our duty as a writer or as a poet is to remind human beings of this certain, um, you know, the art in life or in anything, the beauty of life, human courage, love, these things, but uh, you know, in today's world, like your book is about war, for example, do you think that uh, it's also a writer's job, or a writer could also write morose things, sad things, real things, um, and maybe all have a book end in a very depressing way, but still be moving, and, and how does your book end? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I may I'm, be I'm, bold I'm, enough. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you how the book ends, but that would be unfair on anyone else. You might want to read it because it might spoil it. But I will say that you know every writer has the dilemma about uh, you know do you give an uplifting ending, do you give a downbeat ending, do you give a dark ending? But obviously your subject matter guides you in some way. So for example, if you're writing a book, I don't think I'm giving anything away here. If you're writing a book about Israel. Palestine, it's not going to end with people holding hands and skipping off into the sunset happily. Uh, so, you know, I knew, you know, every novel you want to reach some kind of closure, and on some level you want it to be artistically uplifting for a reader, but one of the things about art in general is that you can be uplifting, in fact, in, in music, it's more obvious in music, the things that are, I find uplifting in music tend to be deeply tragic and sad music. I don't find happy music up, uplifting. So. In that sense, I don't think it's being negative by having a sad ending. And I won't, I won't give away exactly what happens at the end, but I knew from the start that the job of this, this book could not end with sort of hugs across, the, even though it's about a relationship principle between a settler kid and a kid from the other side, a Palestine kid, it could not end with sort of hugs across the barbed wire. If only people could be nice to each other, like the children, everything would be okay. You know, a bad novelist could easily have ended up with that kitsch ending, but I knew from the art, knew from the start that I had to find a way to end it that was not that. You 
came kind of close to giving away the end of the novel. <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. If you have more questions, I'm sure the writers would be happy to speak to you off stage. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. And thank you, Rivka and William. We wish to thank Rivka Chalan and uh, William Sutlef.